So imagine that you can extend your brain outside your physical body. Everything is obedient and organized by action ability. But here is my second brain. It's organizingly passionate. I have open projects here and there, infinite amount branching out interests. I cannot trust or predict my future self, but no worries. Here I have used Tiago Forte's capture, organize, still, and press as my foundational pillars in my second brain. If you're curious, this is what the philosophers, evidence-based theories, and my experience say about this upgraded version. So since Tiago Forte's building a second brain launch in 2016, he has brought the person knowledge management world into the productivity space. Don't get me wrong, BASB is a fantastic course for a beginner to start a PKM journey, but the analogy of a second brain also doesn't provide how the brain's cognition functions. So first, we have to recognize that the brain lives inside a body, and we cannot just think of cognition and initiating actions just from a brain's point of view. The brain is not just a machine that filters sensory information. This view of how the brain thinks and functions is called embodied cognition. And without my body right now, I cannot go see what's on my to-do list. First, we're gonna read Tiago Forte's new book on Kindle and write a summary on how emotions are made, film this video, go to the zoo and have a dinner with friends. Let's get to the table and start reading and see what we can do on improving our cognition. And here's the Priscilla at the desk doing natural work. We're gonna start reading Tiago Forte's book. Since I have been following Tiago Forte's work for like close to two years now, I'm really familiar with his tone of writing and I can skim through. One hour later. Remember the embodied cognition theory that we mentioned at the beginning? Here you can see how embodied cognition comes into play in the context of capture. More specifically to embodied cognition, when the body fabricates a bodily sensation, the brain labels the bodily sensation with a concept, and that's when we experience emotions. We, when we are in a similar situation, that creates a bodily sensation that allows us to label the same feeling as past experiences, our thinking patterns actually aligns. In simple terms, this means that whenever we experience and re-experience similar emotions, our thinking patterns are also overlapped. This means that we have a particular emotional state that we need to be in when we are thinking clearly. So to ex re-experience and refabricate this particular emotional state for creativity and thinking clarity, there has to be a sweet spot of information where I can think clearly. And we'll dive into the exact principles of how I build up this strict filter of for information. We are at the zoo now, so we are going to talk about how we come to knowledge like animals. First step of Tiago Forte's BSAB principles is capture. Capture is when we gather resources like an animal in the natural environment. When we scavenger resources on the internet, we are also trying to scavenger information and knowledge. And yeah, information is a type of food. Tiago Forte says that we are consuming food for thought. We need information to understand the world and to make sense of our resources and our surroundings. Tiago Forte's four criteria for capturing is it surprising, insightful, useful, or personal? But what if I have way too many things that I am interested in? So let's head to the grass eating area of animals to see what is the principle that we can extract from how they eat. And do you know that some of those grass eating animals, like cows, goats, sheep, and deers have four stomachs. Do you know why? They have evolved to eat a lot of grass and grass is not a very um, energy efficient food so they need to eat a lot when food is available. And then when food is not available, they will spit the food back up into their mouth and chew it. We want to make sure that our food is good quality food. We will set up strict knowledge consumption habits and conditions to make our diet very good quality and clean. We also need to spit our knowledge back into our stomach and chew on it, understand it and internalize it. Let me explain how I do this. 
And there are two steps in how I scavenger for good thoughts. This is a cycle of feedback from the information and then initiating a new thought on whether to keep this information or not. Let's see what I mean by this whole feedback loop of capture. <laughs> The first step of the feedback loop is I need to learn how to validate and judge the quality of the information. But first, we have to realize one pitfall. We don't know what we don't know. We don't. This is called Dunning-Kruger effect. So to be really aware of this Dunning-Kruger effect and not be tricked by what we don't know, we will look into the processes of how human create knowledge, gather information, from a philosophical point of view. This is called epistemology. Rarely any authors write about the epidemic status of a piece of content. This means that the author disclose how much understanding, how much research, effort, or thought process that goes into their content and how much confidence they have about their argument that they have claimed. This is a bit of a scary thing to put out as a content creator. I should start doing that on YouTube too. That might be some interesting thing. But if most authors don't disclose their epidemic status, how can I construct my hypothetical author's epistemic status? There are a few questions that I ask myself. Under what conditions are the author's content's main argument? false. And then the second one is where does the source of the information come from? What is the author's credential? Did the author of the content appear as a guest in other podcasts or videos? And what is the intention of producing this content? To gain fame, to sell a course, to be helpful, to be recognized in a particular field? The problem with some online courses is that they always use testimonials and anecdotal evidences. This can be a little bit dangerous because we can fall into something called confirmation bias. The stories and testimonies can make the course seem like it's very very valuable but after you've taken it, it might not be as valuable as the marketing has made it seem to be. Apparently it is very difficult to observe ourselves and find holes in our argument when we think. And yeah, as the famous teacher and physicist Richard Feynman once said, the easiest person to fool is yourself. And yeah, like me talking to the camera right now, the hardest person to face and to be honest to is myself. <laughs> In order to not fall into fooling myself trap, we're gonna follow one of Charlie Munger's really famous models. He says we should invert, always invert. Turn a situation or problem upside down. When you observe the outcome and reverse your thinking, you can find many little pitfalls in how everything flows together. My hands are just dancing. This is true. Under what condition is this one true? And after I I have picked my highlights. The second part of the feedback loop is to see how it fits into my mental world. The question I will ask myself is how does this fit into the big picture? I constantly play with this concept. It's like a kid who's throwing the toy on the floor and see what will happen to that thing to test the object. I'll describe how this highlight fits into my big picture under the annotation in all those Indo, Reader, Instapaper, Podcast apps. By asking the question how does this fit into my big picture, I will be prompt to think about how can this highlight be useful in my life. I can see things from a bird's eye view and from this highlight outwards. I'll give you two examples of how I assess whether to keep a highlight or not from books in science and business. Remember the video that I just posted about how emotions are made? This quote reads like this. Once your predictions are correct enough, they not only create your perception and action but also explain the meaning of your sensations. So I'll ask myself, what is the epistemic disclosure of this? This book. This book is written by an author called Lisa Bear. She is a famous neuroscientist who has studied extensively about the culture and concepts of emotion. This highlight fits into my big picture and it is important to capture because the brain only knows what it has experienced. If the brain does not have previous experience, it the brain will make tons of predictions about how this new event might venture into. Another quote is from Building a Second Brain that I just read in the morning. This quote reads like this, A curator's perspective. We are all judges, editors, and interpreters of information that we choose to let into our lives. I will ask myself, why is Tiago Forte called a world's foremost productivity expert? And I went to the LinkedIn page and read that he studied business in San Diego State University and then he worked at a French consulting firm in San Francisco. He does not have much scientific background and research on how human cognition works. When I read his quote, I'll, I'll shift my point of view into a business lens. His highlight is important to me because I need to develop really strict filters and conditions about what I can let into my system. And 
And yeah, I do understand that this captures process seems very expensive and extra, but all those thinking, process, and discomfort it makes our life so much easier because then the model also consists of hard decisions, easy life. Thank you, bird. Please shut up. I need to record my video. So after we have captured the knowledge with all those principles, so we have a proper curated highlight. Then our next step is organizing and distilling. I like tried his method of organizing things with actionability and, and using progressive summarization to distill information out of my highlights. After implementing it, I came into a lot of problems. What if I don't know what I'm gonna discover it, under what conditions, or under what context? I cannot predict the future. I don't even know how my emotion will change in the next minute or so. I like to connect things from many different sources and I want to progressively summarize and syntopically read many different sources to build my own understanding on the topic. Organizing and distilling does not cover that much of a mega bird's eye view. And I also can't remember what keyword. When I'm reading many different sources, there are similar keywords across many different articles. Yeah, let's skip to Zoo Priscilla again because she's gonna tell us about biological systems can help us actually make our second brain system even better. So what can we learn about complex biological systems, DNAs, and life? Biological systems differ from physical systems. Like physics boils down everything to its first principle. And biological systems are inherently very complicated. We can actually use this word view and benefit a lot from it. When field biologists look at animals and its interaction in an ecosystem, the field biologists understand that they are only looking at a tiny piece of the entire ecosystem. They know that their mental model and comprehension of the entire ecosystem will not be accurate. A insignificant detail such as an environmental factor or a species, we have to look at the interaction of that species with other species. With this mental framework, we can find a lot of insights and survive in this complicated world instead of using single principles like physics. And let's bring it back to the home Priscilla. This kind of biological system thinking can force us to review many insights from insignificant details. So you see, every single highlight is one piece of note. You see, a title of the note would be a declarative statement of the concept that highlight or a piece of atomic information that it represents. There's one highlight or paraphrase in there and I write what it means to me and what is the big picture and why is it useful. And we can also be very aware and understand that the information that reading does not represent the truth or how the world actually functions. There's another thing I want to talk about. It's from my favorite Humans Lab podcast again. He says that most of what we remember take place in the context of something else and is linked by either close, medium, or distant association. So that means that every piece of information exists in relationship to each other. A highlight is just a single piece of fact. And if we don't include this highlight into our current notes database, it won't take us any further because there are no relationships that I can build off of. So here's how I organize all my highlights and locks. Like you see this list of things that I have here, all grouped by themes and concepts that I have in my life. And I have three types of connections. The first one is strong support, second one is marginal support, third one is contradict, fourth one is creative connection. And I've added the contradict column. I feel like it's really important to consider the other side of the argument. Just as Charlie Munger said, we should always invert. Based on the highlight, I will see how it fits into the big picture and this question comes back again and again. I'll see if this highlight contracts or supports my current concepts. And it can be a really interesting argument of different point of views that I have in my brain. After all those processing, this piece of highlight can be reused many, many different times depending on what I'm writing. So to continue to quote about predictions and theory of constructing emotions, the connection that I have a book that I previously read called The Courage to be Disliked. So it says at a restaurant and angry to a waiter. The book actually says we shout at the waiter because the goal of shouting came before anything else. That is to say by shouting you want to make the waiter submit to you. And I will ask myself is this mental framework of looking at emotions from an Eldarian psychology and relate to the theory of constructed emotions? That is kind of true because if our body experiences a a certain interoception and our brain wants to fit a concept to the body sensation so our brain can understand that overwhelming feeling. So I do can fabricate that emotion to with the concept that oh I want to make the waiter comply to whatever request that I have. But trust me from this process I gain so much mental clarity from doing this. As all the prep work that I've done before I write 
my summary on how emotions are made. I'm tired, we're gonna go out for dinner right now. See you guys soon. And I'll write my article when I get back. I just went to the zoo and now we are going to Las Tapas, some spongy Spanish food. Ding. A happy boiled egg. Look at my forehead. I look like a boiled egg and potato. This is the happy boiled egg potato mode. Yeah, and I look like five years old. After dinner, I'm ready to write my actual article. So Steve Jobs once said, creativity is just connecting things. If creativity sounds that simple, why isn't everybody creating for the net? But this is a really good point to start off with. The first thing is to be familiar with our medium of expression before even connecting our ideas. After understanding medium, we will observe our thinking and see are those connections viable and are they actually valuable to the current industry. Sometimes we need to observe and judge our thinking. Evaluating and judging my own work and connections, I can be really really fired up when I'm creating and when I'm judging my own ideas. They're completely two different tasks. But that's because our thinking is influenced by many factors such as my current emotion, my situation, previous things that has happened, my prior knowledge and categories of ideas and what connection I have formed, whether I'm judging or creating ideas and this is called situated cognition. Our cognition is dependent on the situation and the environment, the social context or culture that we are in. This is why it makes thinking and the mind so hard to study. And here are a few tips that I implement situated cognition in my writing process. So first, I will type down all the questions that I have for a particular topic and then use those as anchoring points to open up my curiosity into a wide open space where you can play around with all those highlights. The second one, after I have a few nodes of questions going on, I will ask myself, what is the assumed audience knowledges or tools or ideas, insights they are looking for? How can I be helpful to them? And the third one is to even write more questions about the highlights that I have in order to construct arguments that will help my audience in solving their problems or have an emotional experience that they are looking for. And then whenever I look at a new highlight from this Zettelkasten concept library, I might have a new insight on those highlights and I want to use it in a different way in my content writing process. I like to write answers to my questions. Often I want to focus on the question and developing the argument and the, sh and the backbone of this content. When I dive deeper into different layers of writing, I will open those toggles up and break up the hierarchy of organization and through this extensive process of rinse and repeating, asking questions, developing my thoughts, and accessing my own thoughts and jotting down ideas that I have, I will flush out an article and, and writing in around like two to three hours. And if you like this video, I'm sure that you will like the conceptual note-taking video. And be ordinary, mindful, and curiously fearless. I love you all. Thank you guys so much for watching the video and 